This is not just about web comics, but instead an ongoing feud between a subset of fandom and an imagined enemy, an all-encompassing, overwhelming, censorious force which is simultaneously useless, childish, and docile. This is about reactionary politics and how they seep into our lives and corrupt our worldview. But this video is also definitely about boyfriends, and I can't believe that's true. Friends is a 2020 webtoon by Indonesian artist Ruff Rainbow. Uh, webtoons are just webcomics, except instead of chapters, they're called episodes, and instead of, like, volumes, they're called seasons. That's it! Like, that's the only difference. It doesn't, like, move or anything. Boyfriends is centered around the polyamorous relationship between four guys. Felix, Adrian, Vincent, and Kevin. More commonly known by their simplistic nicknames, Goth, Nerd, Prep, and Jock. Co-willing. There are no shorts. There are no ha. I know. The hate this thing got is pretty interesting given its seemingly inoffensive appearance, but hey, guess there's only one way to find out why, and that's to read it. So, I just finished reading it. The hate that this comic has received is ridiculous. There's a lot to talk about, but. You know, I think that the reason that it's hated so much is because it's it's genuine, because it's sincere. And if there's one thing we hate, it's sincerity. Okay, what the fuck? So, as you can tell from my little reaction there, I, I, I really liked it. I can absolutely recognize the shortcomings and have some criticisms of my own, specifically on a skin tone diversity line. The main cast of fellas are very diverse as far as LGBTQ plus stuff goes, but they are, I think, literally all the exact same color. That isn't to say characters with darker skin tones don't exist, but it's just it's just a little disappointing. That's it, really. The only other thing is just the fact that it's staked part of its identity in the internet culture of the time, meaning that it hasn't aged the best due to how rapidly the internet moves now. That's it for negatives. Everything else I have to say is positive, and that's really fucking with my head. Even if I knew slightly better, I was still expecting the comic to be pretty bad. I was genuinely expecting it to be, you know, actually problematic in some way. Something for me to sink my teeth into and actually have a discussion about. What I found instead was something that was just... nice. As previously mentioned, the comic is about four guys. Vincent is sad that he can't get a boyfriend, missing the obvious signs that his roommate Felix is romantically interested in him. He openly laments how alone he is, leading to Felix showing him how easy it is to get a guy by instantly getting the number of Adrian. But even then, Vincent still fucks it up, being unable to flirt with the last guy, Kevin. Through a series of coincidences, they all fall in love with each other and do a big kiss. Okay, well, that actually takes them like a hundred something episodes, but I digress. The comic is extremely light. While it sometimes does touch on more sensitive topics, it really is just a touch. It doesn't go into them very often, and when it does, it doesn't go very deep. This is most obviously seen with the character of Vincent, who at the start is straight up an alcoholic. This is an extremely touchy subject that gets pretty much glossed over, sometimes even used for jokes. After a pretty huge chunk into the comic, we finally address it a little bit where people get concerned after Vincent passes out for like an entire day. That's just kind of a thing where it's like, oh well, guess I'm not going to do that again. And Felix is just like, oh well, if you're going to stop drinking, I'm going to stop smoking too. We did it! All fucking addictions are solved! No more substance abuse! While I would say that this is a problem, I also understand that it is definitely not the point or the place of the comic. It is not here to offer us a dark and deep look into the minds of these characters. It is here to offer us some playful fluffy bullshit, and that's okay. While I think it lacks in depth, it makes up for in heart and sincerity. I'm a huge fan of the girlfriends, the female equivalents to the main casts. 
I think that their designs are better, most likely because they were designed later, when Refrainbow had more experience. But they're really good and really simple. Goth GF, as she's called, or uh, Luna, I, I think, is a genuinely standout character with a standout design. Uh, she's probably my favourite thing to come out of this, and I wish she was in more of it. I want to talk about one of them, though. Stephanie, another character who does not have a proper name in the comic, is referred to as, as Prep Girlfriend. She's a really interesting case because she's something you kinda don't see often. She is happy trans femme representation. Now, there are a lot of faults here. Stephanie is far from the most realistic depiction of a trans woman, but I worry a lot that younger trans girls feel kinda excluded from the sorts of fandom spaces that boyfriends would have occupied were it not hated so much. I think that even if a bit cringe, even if a bit off in some way, this is kinda nice. We get to see her pre-transition, a rarity in and of itself, her backstory culminating in a mutual breakup with Vincent because she realised she's a girl and, you know, can no longer date a gay man. Maybe it's just the lack of representation elsewhere, but I found this scene to be just a teeny bit moving in how genuine it was. This scene, however, was screenshotted and reposted with the caption, Finally, goddamn, it was about time. Okay, okay, I, j I just noticed that it actually says God, man. Happy that a trans woman was coming out? <laughs> No. You see, this person is either under the false pretense or is actively spreading misinformation about this scene, claiming that it is a breakup between the boyfriend's main cast, posted by a boyfriend's slander account. So what the fuck does that mean? Boyfriend slander is slash was a genre of internet content that was far more prominent a few years back when the series was at its heyday, the premise being to basically just ridicule the series. It is some of the genuinely funniest shit I have ever seen on the internet, not because it is directly funny, but because of how uh, unhinged it is. And I know that that term is quite overused nowadays, but there is no word that describes this better. This is genuinely un unhinged behaviour. It's hard to tell how joking it actually is. It is unclear where the joke ends and real genuine hatred begins. It is so strange. I have never seen people talk about a work of fiction like this before. So let's read a few. He would say a slur, then cry when you call him out on it. No joke. He legit looks and acts like an eight-year-old, yet an eight-year-old is way more intelligent than this dipshit. Not only do I feel dumber for trying to verbalize what you try to type, but I'm slowly losing the will to live. I do not want to live in a world where people like you are given the opportunity to work. Oh, Jesus. Is she necrophilic? Uh, n no, nah, that's where I draw the line. Uh, this is a joke. It's supposed to be cringe. People constantly do this where they take screenshots of the thing. That's the joke, is that it is cringe. What, you think that you, you thought Refrain Bro just thought that this was fucking wicked? Oh. Why the fuck does he have jump? Bro is only 12, the fuck? Why he so pervy? He isn't an innocent being, Emily. Who the fuck is Emily? Fuck you doing sitting on those boxes like a dirty little slut. Like, get your bitch ass down and help your stupid boyfriends. Oh my god. The fuck are sexy cooking lessons? Can't these motherfuckers do anything without being horny for once? What's with that arch? Can you stop being a such a whore? Bro for real got his ass kicked by an onion. That's the joke. Stan, his parents. Uh, if you're wondering what this is about, um, sure, they might hate him. Um, but they hate him because they're transphobic. Jock head cannons. Yeah, yeah. He probably supports <laughs> Chase Schlatt. He probably says that he is LGBT just to say slurs. He voted for Trump in both elections and was angry when the other guy, you know, the other guy and his Biden blast validates maps. Super straight. Oh, you know when this was posted. Anime sexuals and invalidates Xeno genders. I don't get why people like Nerd just because he's cute. Like, people need to realize that he is a fucking hentai addict and a pervert. He literally only uses his boyfriends for sex. I mean, yeah, they suck too, but he's just the worst of the worst. He probably wears glasses for the aesthetic and fetishizes K-pop girls and body shames them, but thinks it's okay because has a ooh, ooh soft innocent baby. But no, he's actually a fucking creep and should go touch grass. I know he would never, but still, I hate nerd. 
The most embarrassing thing ever is that this character is the creator's self-insert. Let's not forget that this character was ready to see dudes shirtless. God forbid that a pansexual guy sees some shirtless men. Call the fucking cops. Fucking creepy. Dude probably is homophobic to other sexualities, but is a pervy gay. Dude tries to hard to be cute, but he's just punchable and everyone wants to shoot him and break him limbs. So who is posting things like this? Well, it seems to be a certain type of person. Despite all of this being extremely aggressive hate towards a very openly queer work, it's gotten basically no right wing backlash, like none at all. None that I'm aware of because they don't know about it. It is so outside their world. Instead, it is all this specific person. Typically young, high amounts of them transmasculine, likes slash liked, Amori, Danganronpa, Genshin Impact, and other gacha games like Project Sekai or Cookie Run. This is who hated boyfriends, and that's what surprises me. This hatred is coming from inside the house. Okay, well, maybe they had a good reason. Maybe they're treating the comic exactly how it deserves. Maybe I missed some extremely obvious offensive stuff, which is entirely possible. I'm a fucking moron. The main criticism is that the comic is in some way fetishizing. That Refrainbo is using these complex queer identities as something to be ogled, to be, quote, jorking it to. Ooh, isn't it so hot when four guys kiss each other? <laughs> This is by far the most potent and effective criticism. Boyfriends follows in the lineage of a lot of other boys love media, uh, just to be clear in this house, we call it yaoi. However, it is also the argument that crumbles the fastest under scrutiny. Refrainbo uh, is a gay trans man. He's not presenting these identities as an exotic, inherently erotic thing. He's not a Fujashi. He, he's... He's the man. It's not even presented in that traditionally misogynistic Fujo manner. You know, the one where women are pushed aside or outright hated for getting in the way of their beloved gay ship. No, they're like part of it. Presented with the same respect as anyone else. While yes, by being side characters, they are often not the focus. It never feels like Refrainbow is going, All right, I love these femoids. Google, show me boys kissing, please. They're all part of the crew, all friends with each other. They're important. They get their own stories, and that's cool in a comic literally called Boyfriends. Hell, one of the main characters might not be a boy anymore, which has interesting implications for the title. So, okay, that argument sucks, unfortunately. What about the other one? Well, the other seemingly common idea is that in some way, nerd is minor coded. So what the fuck does that mean? Coding is generally reserved for minority groups. The most known form of this is probably queer coding and black coding. Taking queer coding as an example, characters who are not queer but are written and or presented in such a way that is evocative of a queer identity. So is nerd uh, evocative of a child? No! Okay, let's not jump the gun here. I could very easily be wrong, so let's hear them out. Oh, what's that? They don't really bother proving it? That being said, this argument definitely holds more water. So, here's what I think is going on. There's two main ways to look at this, on a design level and on a character level. And there are points to be made for both. For one, do they actually look younger? There's a pretty known phenomenon in character design in which the more detail added to a character directly contributes to how old they look. Refrainbow's art style is very simple in a lot of ways, which means lots of nuances about people are lost. This issue was not aided by the character's most defining feature, big huge comical glasses. They give them a cartoony bug-eyed look that only aids in stripping what detail was there, hiding the eyes. Here's an example. How old is Link in The Wind Waker? It might be more complicated than you think. Also, if this long-winded bit about a fictional character's age gets cut out, it either means someone else stepped in or I suddenly gained some semblance of self-control. Okay, so the answer is I gained uh, self-control, but that does not mean that it is forever lost, because it was a lot of it was a lot of work and a lot of writing. Um, and I also do think it's an interesting topic, which means that it will be a Patreon bonus video sometime in the future. Um, you'll be hearing more on that later from our special guest. <laughs> Link is either 10 or 17, with equal evidence to suggest one way or the other. This is all to say that art style could often be really deceiving. I could keep talking about Toon Link, 
I have more points either side, but I'll spare you. This is all to say that even with this in mind, Nerd still doesn't even look like a fucking kid. Sure, he's shorter, but especially when his glasses are off or transparent, you'll very quickly realize he has the exact same proportions and face shape as any other twink character in this fucking thing. I'm sorry, but this is probably the best picture to illustrate this. A friend of mine, when I showed her the character, said he looked like just an anime nerd tech guy archetype and that she couldn't even see where anyone was coming from. So, okay, that part of it is a wash. But what about character? We don't want to actually make some 3,000 year old dragon bit, do we? Look, this is coding after all. It should be more subtle. Nerd doesn't look like a kid, because then Refrainbow's predation would be obvious. No, he hid it better than that. So, one last time. Is Nerd like a kid? So what's going on in this corner? Well, Nerd is on a literal level the youngest character in the main cast. Everything I could find place him at around 19 years old. Well, from what I can guess, it probably has something to do with being cutesy, not drinking, and being a virgin, at least at the start of the comic. That's all I can find. If there's something else, please enlighten me. Let's get the worst point out of the way first. Being cutesy doesn't make someone not an adult. Refrainbow is a fully grown man and made an entire long running webcomic filled to the brim with pastels and pinks. Is he fucking minor coded? This other bit is interesting. So nerds behavior and character traits. The idea that those are what make him like a child and therefore the comic is in one way or another apophilic. This is an extremely immature outlook on life. The idea that to be an adult one has to do certain seemingly adult things uh, is extremely childish. The kind of worldview that only a teenager could have. Someone who's just not that familiar with what adults life is actually like. Defining it around sex and substances. Prep might also act in a cutesy way sometimes but hey he's an alcoholic. Adulthood achieved. And you know, of course that's the view only a teenager could have. Because that's who's posting shit like this. I'm turning homophobic. Um, you're not cute. You're a grown man. Go do your taxes. I like how that's how children work all the time. They just think that adult life is just a never-ending sequence of doing your taxes. Goth headcanons, calls himself a yandere, plays Roblox, and his avatar is a slender, like the man, calls women females in a derogatory way. Do you think any fucking trans kin son <laughs> and other characters with inexcusable actions smells like period blood only is nice to you based on your soot? They couldn't even cut him out to the fucking literal pervert. Him and nerd think women rights is dumb. Pro shipper. Used to make gotcha heat videos? Pro shipper. Okay, so something of note here is there is a frequent reference to one topic, specifically about nerd. In these slander posts, which are just so comically of the time they were made, uh, this is why I was referencing the Zelda video by the way, I feel like people didn't fully get that because it had been too long since this was a thing. Look, this video isn't about boyfriends. So what are pro shippers? Pro-ship, anti-anti, or sometimes pompously called pro-fiction, is a pretty nebulous term, but the general pop understanding is someone who, for one reason or another, likes or is okay with shipping any characters regardless of how questionable that may be. If you're somehow unaware of what shipping is, first of all, how, uh, but it's when you want to see two or more characters do a kiss, or a fuck, depending on your preferences. A discussion in ProShip necessarily involves really touchy subject matter, something I try to avoid on my channel as often as I can. However, this time I'm just gonna say fuck it, so here's all the content warnings for the rest of the video. It never ends. So unfortunately, there isn't really a safe place to jump to. So make your own informed decision on whether to continue watching, and I hope you're doing okay. Lastly, before we really dive in, I need to make it very clear that some of the language that these people use is extremely heavy. We will be talking in ideological and philosophical terms about internet drama, and just no Know if it sounds extremely dramatic that it is not my fault. This is just the terminology used. Without further ado, let's just jump into it. For the first time in this channel's history, I feel like I'm walking on eggshells. When I make a video about Hero Hey, it doesn't really matter nearly as much. And even then, I was nicer than I really wanted to be. Like I'm not gonna lose sleep over pissing off some weeaboo jackass, it's fine. This is different, however. Very different. 
This is a microcosm of so much of what's wrong with the internet. I just hope that enough time has elapsed that we can all be cool. Not even nuance is allowed because each term is so loaded. Everyone is working with their own private definitions of words. If you're pro-ship, you're a big stinky nonce. But if you're anything else, you love harassment and think that killing kids is just wicked. Anti is a fascinating term. It can encompass anything you want it to, but for our purposes, the term is deeply rooted in a specific type of environment. Fandom. To those in fandom, it might seem strange that some people don't get it. But to explain fandom to the uninitiated, I typically go about it like this. There are two major types of fan communities when it comes to media. I describe those as fandom and fan base. For instance, Grand Theft Auto has a fan base. While there are plenty of people who are dedicated to the game, nobody's writing head cannons for Trevor Phillips, nobody's engaging in fan fiction on AO3, and the percentage of fans who are is negligible. Another game just like that, I promise is super relevant, is Half-Life. Half-Life is a late 90s sci-fi boomer shooter in which you play as 27-year-old theoretical physicist Gordon Freeman on his journey to run, think, shoot, and live his way through the Black Mesa Research Facility. It also looks like this. Uh, just keep that in mind. So, what the fuck does any of this have to do with anything? Well, Internet Funny Guy and my favourite streamer, Wayne Radio TV, released the first episode in the YouTube version of his new series, Half-Life VR, but the AI was self-aware, on the 9th of March 2020. What starts is a loose improv comedy let's play with the game being both the added physicality of VR and also the fact that there are NPCs, played by other people, supposedly using advanced AI to gain basically sentience. All of this culminating in an episodic plot in which reality breaks around them. It got very popular. The children yearn for machinima. It genuinely is a really funny series with a lot of great improv from a bunch of really talented and funny people. It almost harkens back to old haunted game creepypastas. I could go on for a long time but that's not what this video is about. Half-Life VR AI through some cosmic event gained a very specific audience. One whose traits I recognised instantly. You see, I was pretty active in the Wayne Radio TV Discord, even making a few videos for them reading off and editing together the funniest posts. Uh, here's a clip of me saying, shitting upwards like I'm spraying venom. But at the time, there was a noticeable difference between new and older fans. Or more distinctly, Wayner fans and Half-Life VR AI fans. This was my reintroduction to fandom. I used to be a fandom person. Person, let's say. I was a Tumblr user during the height of a lot of iconic Tumblr fandoms, the media for which I consumed mostly through cultural osmosis. Because I'm exceptionally bad at consuming media, and my backlog in every medium is crazy. I did watch BBC Sherlock, and it was fucking shit. Doctor Who was actually pretty good, until it got fucking shit. There is a common factor in both of those, Stephen. What I'm witnessing here, however, was different. After years of being outside of it, consuming mostly fan-based media, I was sucked back into the vortex, now a reanimated corpse. It was familiar ideas and terminology, but the core, the soul, was different. I was dropped into a world of kinning discourse, shipping and AUs, all for the half-life funnies. Characters I had seen hundreds of times had taken on new identities, new names, Names. Einstein became Dr. Coomer. That's not Walter, that's Bobby. No, you idiot. That isn't respected Black Mesa scientist slick. That's Tommy. Most importantly is the Black Mesa security team, often all called Barney, leading to the most important part and why I've gone into so much detail. Benry. Fanon. Fanon is the most important thing here. Fans just making shit up. Sometimes on purpose and sometimes accidentally. The point is, is how far removed we are from the original work. Put a pin in that. For now, let's talk about what happened next. Two major things. One, discourse brewing within Half-Life VR AI and my introduction to pro shipping and a Half-Life VR AI fan posting a funny little picture of a cardboard cutout of the character Nagito Kameda. I knew that he was a funny character to post but never understood why so I decided to finally get around to playing the games, looked up which one was the best one and coincidentally it was the one with him in it. This one post ruined my life. I don't know who you are who posted it but fuck you. I hate you. We're fucking enemies now and I will hunt you down. Four years later and I'm still working on a video about that fucking series. Literally to this day, four years of work on one video and I'm not done. I tried to satiate my fucking hunger by publishing a light written version split into parts, but turns out when you split something like this into parts, you sound fucking insane and it's really obviously incomplete. This was the point of no return. I was pulled in. Danganronpa 2 was so good and so much better than the rest of this horrible series and I had no idea what I'd gotten myself into. But I even went back and finished the first game, I jumped right into a community in which I could discuss what I had just played. All the interesting ideas, the way it plays with the format, the minute character interactions. I didn't 
get to do that? Instead, I found a comical level of misery in discourse. The first thing that happened upon joining was being instantly bombarded for asking the question, why is this guy talking in italics? Put a pin in that for later. Good boy. The other thing that happened was the aforementioned discourse. Tumblr user Metrix86 uploaded slightly suggestive artwork of the Half-Life R.I.I. characters Bobby and Tommy, with Tommy having a bite mark. Presumably uh, from Bobby. Tommy is a fascinating topic. We previously talked about coding. In comparison to Nerd, Tommy genuinely feels like a child. Nerd is cutesy but never wore a propeller hat, had his dad organise a birthday party for him at Chuck E. Cheese, and then get visited by his favourite Illumination characters, the Minions. He is generally depicted in fan works as being pretty young, something that both his character and original model are clearly not. Uh, he's 36, and the Gearbox HD version of Slick uh, looks like this. So, this means that in this case, the coding has clearly worked. This makes sense to the backlash tower like this, in which Tommy is adopted as an honorary child by the internet, making this really bad. Not even just that, but this filth was just visible for minors to see. They could get traumatized. This is the supposed anti-mindset personified, melted down into one case study. But there are people who argue that even if Tommy was depicted as being an actual child here, it wouldn't really matter because it isn't real. The overstatement of harm and the exaggeration of content is key. This is the artwork in question. The attitude seeps into every aspect of this mindset. Even the supposed pro shapers who love all this dark stuff do it too. For instance, when Metrix86 defended his art, he described the series itself as having blood, gore, violence, death, and mature themes, translating the man fall down source engine slapstick into something adult and disturbing. This is everywhere in these types of fandoms. For instance, kids gambling game Genshin Impact has its fandom blow things out of proportion constantly. If you listen to the fans, you'll quickly realise that these characters are not engaged in mundane, safe fantasy conflicts, but are somehow committing the most heinous of actions upon each other. Genshin Impact is not a shallow gambling simulator rated for tweens, but instead a deep exploration of some of the worst things that humans can do to each other. This in and of itself isn't exactly the problem per se. It is not impossible for works like these to have dark subtext, as much as I hate that term. For instance, my favourite game of all time, Majora's Mask, is also rated for tweens and has some of the best subtext in anything ever, intentional or otherwise. That's literally one of the best games ever made, and there's a tangible difference between reading into things, exploring your own analysis skills through something seemingly simple, and just outright fabrication or misinterpretation. It speaks to a general unfamiliarity with fiction, how it works and operates. It might come as a surprise to many of us, but a lot of Half-Life URAI's fans just aren't very used to fiction like Half-Life, gritty and aggressively 90s. I saw many anecdotes of people trying the game out themselves because of the funnies, which makes sense, relatively cheap and very easy to run. However, they found themselves abandoning the game for being too scary. To these people, Half-Life AI is mature dark, brutal, and violent, because they don't really know anything else. It is extremely familiar. A media diet of exclusively child-friendly content. It feels like it's Tumblr all over again. The COVID-19 pandemic did a lot of damage to a lot of people in a lot of ways. One of the most fascinating ways this manifested is with the acceleration of online culture. With everyone and everything moving faster than ever, this created a certain attitude that I like to call, ooh, pretentious time, COVID optimism. I'd argue this technically started pre-pandemic with Alice Osman's Heartstopper. However, the actual graphic novels didn't start publication until right before the pandemic in 2019. Heartstopper is the poster child for this certain feeling? Extremely safe, mushy, queer art, notably centering around the two guys. While proving cause and effect is hard, I can't help but feel that Heartstopper had a non-insubstantial impact on queer art, particularly queer art made and enjoyed by young people. Safe is the keyword here. I find that this cheery style was reflected in the online art at the time. I sometimes call it the gay dream fan art style, a very of the time. Why even mention this is because this pastel softness isn't just an art style, but a cultural outlook on life and a way of forming your own identity. They hold themselves to this standard. They see themselves as if they're fictional characters because they see fictional characters as real people. But fiction, fiction isn't reality. Right? If you're a pro shipper, then the separation of fiction and reality is your everything. This idea is the sole building block of your identity. You have staked yourself on this concept. So it's a good thing that they're separate. Well, there are many variations upon the phrase fiction is not reality, with that one being the stupidest, but technically most correct. Fiction is not reality. Good job. 
No, many have pivoted to the more nuanced and somehow more wrong phrase, fiction doesn't affect reality. Whichever variation you go for, it doesn't really matter, because they all serve the same purpose. A mantra to repeat to stop criticism. If someone is criticizing a thing you like, you can just say the magic words to make them go away. Fiction isn't reality is not an argument. It's a shield and they keep thinking if they spam it properly, they're totally going to get that perfect parry. What is and isn't covered under this defense changes? Most don't speak on, say, racism. That's again, just because they don't really mean anything by this. I've tried to be nuanced before, but I got the same response. I think a common point of contention and why it looks like people aren't listening is because of this simple problem. When we read the phrase, we take it to mean that they believe that fiction and reality are two separate domains that do not intersect, that have no bearing on each other. And that is obviously wrong and extremely devaluing towards the fiction they claim to love and protect. But as I look into things more, I've come to realize that this isn't what they mean. Instead, the idea is that the literal events of fiction do not occur in real life. For instance, if I kill a man in GTA 5, that does not contribute to the actual LA murder rate. Obviously. The idea being that no actual harm was caused to any real people. This may seem obvious and even like I'm wasting my time specifying, but because they never clarify what they mean, I felt it was necessary to go into both interpretations. I'm not exactly in the market for sweeping over generalizations, but it is hard to ignore how anti-criticism this feels. That despite being the supposed pro-fiction side, there is a seeming inability to engage with art in a meaningful way. I often wonder if this stems from an unwillingness to recognize the faults in art we like. In my very first video I mentioned how annoying it is that criticism is often conflated with hating. That if you even dare say anything negative, even if constructive, that you are in some way anti-insert thing. As an example, I give a genuine criticism of one of my personal favorite games, Half-Life and its representation of women or lack thereof, and I got the very same backlash to it. It appears as though a large group of people cannot imagine liking something unless you love everything about it uncritically. Think the fan service of teenage girls in anime is off-putting and makes you personally uncomfortable? Well then you're not an anime fan. You're a tourist. No thought is given to how people might love the stories being told, appreciate the dedication and artistry of animation, no. If you don't like fan service, you don't like anime. It's a core part of its identity. All or nothing. I am extremely pro art and very anti censorship but I'm even more pro-criticism. We could point to more specific cases, couldn't we? Even within the video I mentioned, the literal phrase, fiction isn't reality, is used in a rather incoherent way. But at the core of it, what a pro-shipper claims to believe, putting a big asterisk on screen because I know you motherfuckers are probably gonna try to take this one out of context, what a pro-shipper claims to believe is generally, at its core, good. We should all support fiction, letting people tell their stories, share their own unique experiences. Antis have, supposedly, forced people to out themselves and relive traumatic memories just in the hope to gain permission to write fiction about the things that have happened to them. That is not a world anyone would want. Of course, we're not working with the roots, are we? Typically, we talk about a rotten core, but this time, it's the branches that are dead. But first. Is that celebrity guest Penis Drager from Drager You? Has this ever happened to you? Oh my god, I have too much money. I have so much money and I don't know what to do with all of this cash that I have. Then you should consider joining the Kaizo for Aspiring Vampires Patreon for such amazing features like behind the scenes content. Have influence over the videos by giving feedback. Not to mention periodic bonus content that would just really, just really fuck up the algorithm if I tried uploading it normally. I mean, if Ka I'm Prager, dead penis man, fuck. Once you subscribe, you can gain access to all these perks through the exclusive hooligan channel on the server. Oh yeah, the server, which is free to join for anybody. Okay, I've lost the fucking voice. It's an amazing community and we're trying to build it more. It has great features, such as amazing emails. You can send text, images, video, and even sound. The Kai's Home for Inspiring Vampires community server will cater to all your needs. Carl, please donate to PragerU. Carl, behead my father. Are you good or evil? The Kai's Home for Inspiring Vampires community server has a morality system, so watch out. 
Is your boat skipper? Is your boat? Will be tagged good or evil? I've never said that out loud before. So make sure to put your money in my pocket. I mean, Kai pocket. And join the guys home for aspiring vampire Patreon. <laughs> this was a this was a Patreon request. I had to do it as Dennis Prager. If you're wondering, that wasn't this wasn't my trick. While it appears as though anti is the older term, the modern use of the word seems extremely deliberate. In the misleading framing that everyone who isn't me is anti-fiction, pro-censorship, or more perniciously, everyone who isn't me thinks harassment is just wicked. When we talk about this misleading framing, we obviously have to talk about how pro-shippers see themselves and their opposition. Pro-shippers are rational, level-headed adults just getting by making art. Sure, everybody was a pro shipper until the fucking Puritans came along and ruined everything with their woke social. Uh, wait, no, no, sorry. The antis are actually much closer to that of conservative extremists. They're the new concerned Christian parent, reversing your rock songs for hidden satanic messaging, banning D&D in your house because it's witchcraft. With this, Pro vs. Anti is framed as a queer rights issue, in which the anti is simultaneously a stupid, overly sensitive kid to be dunked on, one who knows nothing about anything, and also a direct threat and oppressor. Does this sound familiar to you? Getting ahead of myself? This feeling of oppression is core to the pro shipper identity, so much so that it causes major problems. Hannibal. Hannibal has a major fandom of pro shippers. It seems to be where a lot of tropes and ideas come from. Directly supported by the show's creator, Brian Fuller, who at the very least was a self-identified pro-shipper, and most likely still is. By viewing themselves as oppressed, it has led to the extremely awkward use of symbols, most notably some pro-shippers using the pink triangle. What's the pink triangle, Kai? The pink triangle was a Nazi symbol used to signify sexual deviance in concentration camps, under paragraph 175 of the Penal Code, primarily targeting gay men. The symbol has been reclaimed as one of pride and perseverance, and as a result, it's just so fucking inappropriate and frankly annoying. To appropriate its use as an icon for your shipping war is Ryan Fuller holding pro shipper merchandise brandishing the pink triangle. You'll note how uh, trans women are completely removed from the conversation despite also being brandished with the pink triangle because, surprise surprise, a fascist ultra-right regime branded trans women the same way they did men. You might have noticed something, a specific focus on pro shippers, when they're not the actual initial problem this video is about. You'll recall that pro shippers were being made fun of. This is because pro shippers were something I had to learn about, but aunties, aunties came to me. So why was that person speaking in italics? Well, because that was the way they signified who they were in their system. Italics meant that they were Danganronpa V3 protagonist Shuichi Saihara. It was at this point in particular that I realized I had been transported into an alternate reality, one in which the world as we understand it was completely fucked out the window. Now, I had been familiar with dissociative identity disorder, let's say. Of course, I'm no medical expert. However, I hadn't really heard of this happening. Not like this. When I tried researching the topic, the first thing I immediately did upon being told this, I noticed a trend of extremely independent sources. We're talking random websites and blogs, TikTok and Tumblr accounts. They could be telling the truth for all I knew, but how could I trust them? I'll discuss this more at a later date, and my goal isn't to lambast these people. However, I then in an instant, realized just how surreal this was. The sheer amount of systems was, needless to say, unreal. I had never heard of this happening. The crazy number of them was hard to ignore. Now maybe, just maybe, this was simply a safe haven for them. A place to go in a world that refuses to even try understand them. A world that uses psychotic as an insult. Something I'm probably guilty of in this very script. However, as I thought about it more, really thought about it, I realized that this was a borderline statistical impossibility. That so many people had this rare disorder, that for so many people it manifested in this specific way, where they got to be all their favorite characters from their current fixation. It didn't seem right. It was impossible. It's because kids these days have a really fucking weird relationship with fictional characters. When I tell you that people are treating fictional characters like real people, I'm not exaggerating. It is an actual core tenet of anti-belief. You 
have to do this. If you don't adopt this rule of thumb, then it will inevitably lead you down a supposedly bad road. To an anti, it's not just that fiction affects reality. Similarly to with the pro shippers, you and I might read the words fiction affects reality and agree with them, but again, they're working with a completely different vocabulary here. When an anti says fiction affects reality, what they kind of mean is that fiction is reality. And that is really strange. At the very core of anti-belief is that what we consume has a serious and notable effect on who we are and our morality. It's the old saying, you are what you eat, except this time for your media diet and not your real diet. There are a lot of easy dunks we could make on pro shippers. In the earliest version of the script made a long time ago, even before the Sarah Z video, we both independently jumped to the same example, The Turner Diaries, one of the most vile books ever made. A work of fiction that caused real life attacks. The organization seen within the book became real, or at least attempted to. They killed actual people, real people. It inspired one of the most heinous crimes I have ever heard. He was murdered by two white supremacists who wanted to start the Turner Diaries early. The actual fucking gall you have to have to compare this to some fanfic you didn't like is actual monster behaviour. I have tried to be impartial this whole time, but no, no, fuck you. Seriously. Actually delete your account if you think this. If you think fucking this is comparable to anything created by some kinda creepy pro shipper, then you are brain dead. It should come as no shock that there's a tangible difference between general art and media and actual, literal, fucking propaganda. Yeah, hmm, it might be that propaganda has a stronger influence on people than when they just read a fic. I don't know. William Luther Pierce wasn't exactly aiming to create a great work of fiction, he was aiming to create a blueprint. The Turner Diaries is a guidebook, a step-by-step -step plan. Pierce wasn't just some author, he was a fucking dangerous man with hundreds of pages of FBI documents on him. The book was published via a white supremacist publication. Anyone making an argument like this should be discredited instantly. It is actually ridiculous how terrible and offensive this is. This comparison should upset you. Just take a deep breath. This is the exact kind of thing I hate doing. I didn't want to talk about this in particular because I'm a vampire fox on the internet and it feels extremely inappropriate. But of course, when trying to be comprehensive, you unfortunately have to brush upon these topics. I am trying to be as respectful as I can, but it is infuriating to see people do comparisons like this. I don't know how to transition out of this in a respectful way, but hey, true crime YouTubers treat real human death like it's gossip, so I'd say I'm doing pretty well. Antis tend to focus on the sexual, but of course, they've gotten a lot of flack for this in the past, being criticized for only talking about sexual content and never violence. As a result, they've responded to the criticism by getting worse. I'm starting to see people genuinely believe a very specific thing. This video really isn't about boyfriends, but it is about the Mega CD or Sega CD if you live in a not real country. Ah, what a great uh, thing. The Mega Drive had a bunch of weird add-ons during its life, like the 32X. Uh, both were great if you wanted to play like really weird Sonic games, but only one of them let you be a little sick freak. And that was the CD. The CD gave the Mega Drive the ability to, so you'll, you'll never guess. By using the power of CDs, games could play actual pre-recorded music and have it sound okay. Doesn't end there though, because it could also play full motion video. It was like if video game were real. This will be graphics in 2012. This led to the release of Night Trap. Night Trap is an abysmal full motion video interactive schlocky horror film about a sleepover getting raided by, uh, vampires? I'm not, not sure about that one. Not sure I appreciate this representation. You were working for the Sega Control Attack Team, or SCAT. Jesus Christ. You have to save everyone by watching security cameras, oh my god. So this stupid, inoffensive horror schlock must be some cult classic or something that made no stir at all. Why is there courtroom footage? Oh dearie me, it appears as though we started a moral panic. That's right, violent and sexual video games were corrupting the kids into, I don't know, being vampires, I guess? Oh, wait a second. It truly was just a huge classic game of let's shit on Sega with then chairman of Nintendo of America, Howard Lincoln, stating that Night Trap will never appear on a Nintendo system. Okay, so I haven't exactly been honest with you. Uh, make a Lincoln joke here. You see, I've been showing you footage of the Nintendo Switch port, which firstly, haha, but secondly, it means that this is what it actually looked like. It is 
profoundly sad to see that we haven't fully moved past this and that there are many young people so caught up in this form of fictional character activism that they are unironically parroting conservative politicians who got ridiculed into dust. Do you really want to be the modern Jack Thompson? An activist so deranged he saw himself as Batman, would drink from a Batman mug, had a Batman watch, and when asked for ID would send his driver's license with a picture of Batman pasted on top instead of him. He viewed himself as a vigilante because he tried to sue people into submission with his puritanical values and censor obscene and degenerate art like rap music and video games. When former Attorney General Janet Reno denied his request for suing radio host Neil Rogers over some naughty words, Thompson handed her a letter asking her to pick a box, reading, I, Janet Reno, am a homosexual, bisexual, or heterosexual. If you do not respond by that date, then you will be deemed to have checked one of the first two boxes. She put her arm on your shoulder and said, I'm only attracted to virile men, which is why I'm not attracted to you. <laughs> And then you filed battery charges. Jack Thompson was then not allowed within 500 yards of Rogers. I still have a few major personality flaws to work out, but I am not crazy. I have to work on tolerance a lot. Anger and impatience with God and others. Sometimes these things get me in trouble. In Shrieking Troops video, I want to fist fight Colleen Hoover, they bring up the point that a lot of this stems from a very specific misunderstanding about fiction, one that can only arise from the aforementioned unhealthy media diet. You see, to a lot of people, their experience with fiction has been very self-indulgent. Keep in mind, these are capital F fandom users, uh, not the website, like the, you get it, I'm saying the, therefore they've consumed a lot of like, fan fiction? I'm not here to knock fan fiction or whatever, but it is undeniable that as a medium, it tends to be more self-indulgent. To these antis, they can't really grasp why someone would write about something if they didn't like it. They write and read about things they like, so everyone else does too. It is an unwillingness to understand that not all media is meant to be enjoyed, that sometimes people create art to be challenging, to make you think, to make you uncomfortable. It's like when people think games have to be fun instead of interactive experiences that can elicit any emotion. To these people, if you write it, it means you like it. And if you don't like it, then consuming it will make you like it. Depiction to them is inherently glorification, unless, and I kid you not, the wrongdoer in question gets their comeuppance. I'm not kidding here. It strongly harkens back to the Motion Picture Production Code of 1930, nay, the Hayes Code. Now, I previously went over how you have to be really careful with your comparisons, that comparing random internet artists to actual propaganda isn't very good. But this, this is just gay haze code. It is really just gay haze code. A fun little progressive paint job over, you know, the haze code. It similarly required clear and direct condemnation, lest the simple minds of the audience, especially the children and the lower classes, be corrupted by the allure of sin. You cannot show literally any sympathy towards wrongdoers. They must be punished by the narrative or else we as viewers will think they're just fucking so cool. I'm not saying people do not take inspiration from fictional characters. However, you know, the people who take after awesome Sigma males like Walter White and Rick Sanchez weren't exactly great people to begin with. If you have molded at least a bit of your personality around a character, chances are you already had more in common with them than you've realised. That This is all to say that fiction can change and move us, resonate with us, but it can't really corrupt us with the mere act of depiction. Bin, bin. When looking for the anti-perspective on things, I was hit with a distinct sense of deja vu. It was truly like history was repeating itself, and that once again I was stuck with comically independent sources. It speaks to a strange anti-intellectualism to reject anything academic in favour of, well, what their friend said. They trust the perceived authenticity of their online mutual, and are more distrusting of the presentation of academia, subconsciously or otherwise. Fiction Effects Reality Card is a source that I've been pointed to, and it is the perfect encapsulation of this. Disclaimer, I'm not making a direct political comparison, but just a discourse comparison. There's an idea in political discourse that the right are short, quippy, and wrong, while leftists go on elongated spiels. This is the fandom discourse equivalent. Antis go for informal, aesthetically pleasing, and wrong, 
the card itself didn't actually do anything? Basically, all of its information comes from a Tumblr gimmick account that considers Call Me By Your Name and Detroit Become Human to be unacceptable fiction, and can't even spell Junko Enoshima's name correctly. Sorry, I meant Junko Enoshima. Also, for the record, I do think Detroit Become Human is unacceptable fiction, but that's only because it sucks. If fucking Homestuck characters are too much for you, then there's a problem. In clarification as to what they consider unacceptable, they say some very fair things, but follow it up by saying that just general grossness in canon is a problem, and like, what the fuck does that mean? That doesn't sit right with me. What is considered gross? Is it unacceptable if a character has the runs? Also, you know this means that the creator of the card did basically nothing right? All they did was write a bit of passive-aggressive drivel. Okay, but like, Maybe the sources are good and really cool and not shit. I mean, I feel something, I feel something burning. Is that the Sun M magazine? <laughs> if you're an American, which I have a feeling the creator of the card is, then you might not know how bad this is. Literal top source. The Sun. The Sun, for the uninitiated, is a right-wing, very conservative, sensationalist tabloid. Fuck me, man. This is not a reliable source, even fucking slightly. Oh, no, actually, when proofreading this section, I realized I forgot to mention that they cite the New York Post, another sensationalist conservative tabloid, this time American. Is this a fucking psyop? Okay, whatever. How about we actually look at it? Alright. James Holmes, apparently inspired by the Dark Knight series. Wait, but they directly condemned the villains. That's th that's what you want. I Okay. Uh, hold on a fucking second. He wasn't inspired by the film at all. Not even your own sensationalist source actually says he was. The closest fucking thing was that he dyed his hair orange to look like the Joker? You know, the Joker, with his famously orange hair. That iconic orange hair that he has in every depiction. Oh, that's the Joker with his orange hair. He went to the screening of the sequel to an immensely popular film because he wanted to do maximum damage. He properly planned this out, deliberately going for a midnight showing because he believed killing children was immoral. He believed that each person was worth one point and that for each kill, he'd earn a point. If his life had more value, he wouldn't have to kill himself. This was his way of raising the value. Just like the Joker! This is a very disturbed man. One who clearly needed serious help. This is not fucking Batman's fault. Okay, what else they got? Oh my god, they're blaming Grand Theft Auto, and holy shit, they're blaming Doom for school shootings. It is literally Jack Thompson, oh my god. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Jack Thompson. And if you don't respond to my form in time, it means you're a queer. You know what the problem with Ireland is? It's all the queers. <laughs> Two queers came in. <laughs> and one of them had hooks for hands, and he dig him into the back of the other fella and just start riding him. <laughs> No one's gonna get that reference. I just look like a fucking lunatic. So we've established that aunties have terrible opinions about art, but does that really matter? I mean, who are they, right? What power do some ignorant tweens have? Well, according to pro shippers, a fucking lot. They're dangerous radical puritans and maybe even a cult. This video is not about boyfriends, but maybe it's about cults. So are aunties a cult? Samantha Abarime is an Akka fan whose main priority has been to discuss the puritanism and sex negativity of aunties, with a particular focus on the misconceptions and misunderstandings Western fans have about sexuality in Asian media. James, which means we're talking about yaoi. Let's fucking go. Holy shit, it's been one of those videos past the yaoi cocaine, baby. This video isn't about boyfriends, but it's about fucking yaoi. Wait, okay, wait a second, okay, it's kind of not about Yaoi. Aberdeen May's first work being 2021's The Cult Structure of the American Anti for the Journal of Transformative Works. Worth noting is that it is owned by the Organization for Transformative Works, the OTW, nay, 
AO3, which despite being the overall biggest fanfiction website today, is notably aligned with the kind of ideology pro-shippers work under. Not an outright rejection of Aubrey May's work, far from it, but just something to keep in mind. In the cult structure of the American Anti, Aubrey May argues that antis are very similar to right-wing puritanical groups of the past and present, that their ideology directly harms the most marginalised of us. That if we were to take anti-ideas as truth, then we'd also have to accept the idea that yeah, the conservatives are right. Under this framework, showing LGBTQ plus art and media to children will turn them gay. But you know, that isn't true. This is standard anti-anti-argumentation. However, Aubrey goes further to compare antis to QAnon, as they weaponize morality by claiming to be on the side of protecting children from predators, and that all those who oppose them are pro predator. That according to the bite model for recognising cults, antis perpetuate a climate of fear and violence that by convincing themselves and others that their opposition are predators, it means that there is an anxiety inherent to speaking up against them. It has very little to do with protecting children, as much as it has to do with egotistical online callout culture. For instance, a frequent issue is the redistribution and circulation of content they consider to be harmful, which is literally just showing kids porn. DO NOT DO THIS! Especially if you think that the content in question is actually illegal. The thing you do not do is download it and share it around like it's a bit of gossip. This isn't like leaked DMs that spice up some drama. Do not share that! Especially not with kids! Now, where Aubrey May loses me is the idea that antis are doing this as a form of desensitization, that perhaps they're claiming to be allies in the attempt to get kids used to this sort of thing, to feel safe with them in an attempt to groom them. This is very serious to just say. To claim that it is because they want to groom people is irresponsible. What it clearly is, is an attempt to stir up hatred and controversy by using words that evoke our deepest anger. Because there is nothing that we hate more than predators. They don't want to desensitize anyone, because if they do, they lose their ammunition. Think about the word groomer itself. What was an extremely useful term has been completely ruined by the right, making it so that the very existence of trans women is in some way grooming. I do genuinely believe that antis hate predators as much as anyone else does, but that they care about internet points just a little bit more. Abarimi appears to be just saying, no you. Oh, antis claim we're nonces? No you. Haha, <laughs> got him. There's also one more really glaring problem. But it's also relevant to the next paper, so... Hate narratives, condition language, and network harassment, a new breed of anti-shipper and anti-fan, antis, for the Journal of Fandom Studies is, for sure, better. It focused on the dehumanization inherent to antis, that once you engage with the forbidden, unacceptable art, that your status as a human being, whose emotions should be taken seriously, is immediately revoked. And you become the platform in which people gain their engagement at the cost of your mental health. Well, Aberime has a bit of a citation problem. You see, they also have an issue with taking absurd jokes very, very seriously. Lots of these are taken from drama accounts and therefore are in and of themselves part of a constructed reality, one in which there is a narrative already there. For all the problems I have with Aberime's work, there is actually a really good point underneath all the stuff. That is, that antis have a lot in common with radfems. That isn't the only good point, I have a lot of respect for them, I'm sorry if that sounded weird, Aberime has been very helpful in the team like a really nice genuine person uh rad fems should be fucking awesome i mean radical feminism that sounds great we should all be radical feminists i wish unfortunately a group of people who aren't really feminists nor are they radical have just decided that that's their term the major overlap is extreme sex negativity not just a personal preference or anything but instead the idea that it is bad on principle that kink is inherently harmful or that fictional depictions of abuse are equal to their real life counterparts both rad and aunties frequently baby women, remove their agency, treat them as if they've been corrupted just for having preferences. To be good, to be a real person, you have to be somewhat asexual or else it is just degenerate perversion. They don't just look down at the people who enjoy this but directly exclude them from their supposedly progressive politics. These aren't real women, not real queer people. Their status is marginalized, it's disregarded. They are freaks of colour. Of course, this isn't even to mention the utter hatred for trans women in every single way. Phew, okay, so that's... Oh, it's a lot. Oh, let's take a break, shall we? Hi, this is the intermission. I'm so fucking tired, man. Ah, uh, if you've made it this far, thank you so fucking much, man. This is... 
Uh, uh, this is crazy. Um, this is one of my favorite. Oh fuck! <laughs> I'm so tired, man. Um, of course, like usual, uh, we got some great fucking fan art. Um, mostly shared um, on the Discord, pretty much exclusively shared on the Discord. But you can send it on Twitter as well. Please join the Discord. We've been having a fucking blast recently. It has been some of the most fun I've had in like a long time. There's, they're great people there. We've we've culminated a really nice community so far. It's nice and small. Get in there while it's nice and small. Help help be a pillar of the community. Um, we do reward those. We have special roles uh, like major community contributor to people who've done lots and are just really great. Um, I'm yeah. Thank you all so much for the support. Um, thank you all for the art. Thank you all for everything. This has been great, and I really hope you enjoy this video. Uh, I love you all. I really do. Um, and thank you so much for sticking around. Back to the video. With that, let's just take a step back. We've been wailing on aunties for a while now, so let's stop thinking in ideological terms and start actually talking about this in practice. How these groups actually act. Which is with unbearable cringe. It's cringe. I don't like to use that word, but they're all cringe. There's an undeniable stereotype that pro-shippers are repeatedly victimized by children. Which is, in and of itself, a very funny concept. Any jokes made at their expense are treated as extreme harassment. It's that victim complex I talked about earlier. It also can't be ignored how aunties and rad femmes are at least implicitly supporting anti-porn and censorship builds that are doing extreme damage to people. Backed by the Republican Party in America. These bills get to define whatever they want as pornography, which includes you. Being queer or trans to them is porn. It is inappropriate. It is damaging to minors for all the same reasons you think GTA is ruining society. Okay, aunties clearly seem worse, huh? And, uh, kinda, maybe, not really? Why did I make that sound? No, seriously, why the fuck did I make that sound? How did I make that sound? What the fuck? However, there is just one problem. There's this, to put it lightly, tumor grafted onto the side of pro shippers, an uncontrollable parasite that has latched onto them. Yet, we're talking about Lolly Cunny 1488, who you can always rely on for the best takes. For instance, I was just on Twitter and saw a post about Saints Row, which is rare enough as is. That's when I saw the, uh, insane take that 2 was bad and 3 was good. Saints Row 2 is the best open world crime game of all time. God, who posted that? Oh, far right lolly obsessed chud lord. I occasionally retweet hentai, so if you don't like it then fuck off. Oh, and there it is. Minors and trans do not interact. I don't apologize, so don't expect one. I'm learning ASL. And he's located- Oh! These guys are profection really in name only. You may have noticed that when describing pro shippers that a lot of attitudes and terminology may sound familiar. That's because these bozos have just stolen all of it. That's right, pro fiction. Fiction is not reality. The hatred of anti is coming in and ruining everything that was just fine before. It's all here. Because these people normally would absolutely hate pro shippers, you know, for being gay and shit. You know, for all time's sake, why don't we check back up on Hero Hey? Insomniac Games said, What is your favorite quote from Marvel's Spider-Man 2 PS5? Give people stuff you know they want, so you can inject things yeah. that maybe they aren't familiar with, or maybe they don't know they want, but make them like that stuff. No, hey, he's probably talking about how they bring back classic ideas, suits, and characters, but try to do something new with them. He's probably talking about how they brought in the Raimi black suit, but also made Miles a fucking wizard casting spells. Okay, probably not that, but seriously. And then Sael responds. I think it's actually Sael, not Seal. My bad, so. What? You couldn't even do a second take. Hey, it's like fucking 1 minute 52. I've taken two fucking minutes at most. He says, Insomniac blocked me for a video quoting creative director Brian Inathar as it must be difficult handling the truth of him ignoring fans and doubling down while catering to games journalists like Stacey Henley. Hey, that's a fucking social media intern. It is not Insomniac themselves. They blocked him because he was being a weirdo implying a secret agenda. Do you think they're trying to hide this? He said it out loud in an interview. Insomniac Games, developer of Spider-Man 2, blocked me for this tweet immediately after virtue signaling to my race about, quote, amplifying voices on, quote, yet locking comments. Comments. My tweet is a quote from Brian Inathar. You and your team are pathetic. I don't know if you know this. Uh, Brian is not in the game, so a quote from him doesn't work. Saying hashtag Black History Month, and saying, as you can see here, this month and always, we seek to amplify their voices. Hmm. 
You blocked a singular black man and yet you support Black History Month. Hmm. Curious. What's this? Oh, I remember this game. I wonder what Hi has to say about it. I mean, I haven't played the game myself. I just don't understand all the hate. Like, there's so many games out there that Twitter cop types would find quote-unquote problematic. Yet, they're radio silent about all those games. But when it comes to this one, there's just like extreme outrage from those people. God, yeah. Those fucking Twitter cops, right? For his sake and his own integrity, I really hope that they're the ones responsible and that people didn't just run with an assumption. I really hope Hay doesn't have misleading and outdated information just fully up on his account to this day. That would be bad! Versus Desu is a YouTuber and Twitter Blue subscriber who... <sighs> God, I can't... I can't do this anymore. Rev is like if Hay was somehow more annoying. They're both VTubers now. Rev has been tarnishing the image of Nico Yazawa for years now. Please back off. First of all, she's too old for your Rev. Third year is when they turn 18. His avatar is Nico wearing glasses. Great job. Totally original character. Do not steal. People have been requesting I talk about him for a while now, but like that would require me to watch his videos. Seriously though, Rev is the definition of content. It is slop. I can't talk about this. There is nothing to say. Well, he was at the forefront of the controversy surrounding the coffin of Andy and Lele. You see, Rev is also the definition of just fucking playing the hits. As far as content mills go, he's so blatant. When something works even more egregiously than Hey, in fact, he was still talking about the game only a few weeks ago and was also talking about Hogwarts Legacy. God, slow news day, huh? The coffin of Andy and Lele was truly the thing that seemingly wedged anti and pro shipper discourse into the more mainstream part of the internet, as many were quick to contend the game as unacceptable. Is it? No. The Coffin of Andy and Lele is a top-down adventure game. It's a genre I really like, in the lineage of Mad Father, The Witch's House, and my personal favourite, Pocket Mirror. The main controversy was over the possible incestuous relationship between protagonists Andrew and Ashley Graves. It's... whatever. The game has a good, weirdly nostalgic style. The dialogue can be good. The game is overall playful, with an almost whimsical tone to the extreme brutality and depravity. The game got a very divisive response, which kinda sucks. It's fine. A bit edgy, a bit full of itself, but nowhere near deserving of the hate it received. With Rev jumping headfirst to defend it, spreading the narrative that Western antis were all over this, ruining fiction once again, culminating in the doxing of the game's creator. So I guess that's it, right? The pure teens have gone too fucking far. This is why the West can't have nice things. We're all too sensitive and oh. The creator was doxed because they thought she might be trans. Ah, right. That of course didn't stop people immediately just guessing what had happened. Serial pro-fiction losers instantly jumping to conclusions because of course this stupid made-up culture war is also going to obfuscate real issues. Always going to turn everything back to fandom bullshit no matter what happens. No matter what happens. How can we make this about consumption? Why is there this weird trend? Why are trans women in particular victimized at every step? We started this video off with the misgendering and corruption of a scene of a trans woman coming out and ended up here. By the way, Boyfriend Slander is rife with the intentional misgendering of trans characters, which is which is just so fucking strange. This video is not about boyfriends, but it is about art. I want you to go and make whatever you want. Go write or draw your personal weirdo fantasies, and of course, be open to criticism. Understand when and where you might have been offensive and how to grow from there. Pro shippers beg for this prelapsarian time in which media literacy was supposedly alive and well, but truth is, it never was. However, we can take steps to create that future. Go out there, read and create. Initially, one of the first videos I ever wanted to make was about some fairly dark Yuri manga. I had a lot to say, a real point to make. But I was too worried. Too worried that I'd get shit for it. Too worried that I'd be lumped in with the likes of Hay. Life is too short to be worrying about stuff like this. There's a lot to talk about. Like, a lot. A lot, a lot. But I'm only scratching the surface here, unfortunately. This is not a definitive video. This is not the end. But it is a start. I've been Kai from Kai's Home for Aspiring Vampires. Go and read a weird fanfic about something you like. Or hell, write one. Write a story in a world you love. And if you get criticism for it, own that shit. I'll see you eventually. Try not to fall off a building this week. I would also like to thank patrons It's June and Gamma Freya. Um, that's crazy that I even have fucking any. I'm sure everybody else didn't know what to do, and then the other fellow just sprouted- <coughs>
and then the other, <coughs> and then the other fella just spread wings and flew out the fucking window, like. 